Verse 8, God says, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house. If this is the purpose and and summary of, of Haggai, this is it. Build my house, God says. Obey my word. Go to the hills, bring wood. Instead of bringing wood to build your own paneled houses, bring wood to build my house. There are two reasons why God calls them to build their house. Notice none of these reasons are so that we can taste economic stability and prosperity again. None of these reasons are so that we can get out of the trouble that we're in to have enough money or food to feed ourselves. The two reasons why we are called to obey, or they are called to obey to build God's house, is so that I may take pleasure in it and so that I may be glorified, says the Lord. These reasons for obedience are for the sake of God alone for his pleasure, and for his glory. Incidentally, uh, commentators point out that these are the exact two functions of the temple, that in the temple when sacrifices are made, um, God is satisfied and pleased by the sacrifices of the people, um, and the temple was the place where God's glory dwelt. So also when God calls them to obey, to build the house, to rebuild this temple, this place that God has said, my name, my presence, my glory will dwell here with this people for all time. Um, God says, build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and so that I may be glorified. These are the reasons for our obedience as well. And God desires our obedience and not our excuses. Because again, this will come at an inconvenient time for us that it comes at a cost. Verse 9, God reveals himself as the bringer of this economic suffering. He says, you brought it home, I blew it away. That is incredibly frustrating. One of the joys that I have in working hard is to be able to come home and tell my wife I brought home the bacon. Um, And I take a little bit of a manly pride in that. You know, here's the bacon, you can cook it now. I brought it home. Um, Actually, For me, I just bring home the paycheck and my wife does the shopping, so maybe I should do more of the shopping to literally bring home the bacon. But the point is, it is frustrating when you work hard to bring it home and then God's like, and it's gone. That's frustrating. And it might make us very angry at the Lord to work hard and to hear him say, oh, is that where that went? I blew it away. That that is frustrating. But God says, this is what is happening in your life. And I'm telling you, what is happening in your life so that you can consider your ways and repent and obey. You brought it home. You looked for much. It came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Why is this, declares the Lord of hosts? Well, in case you didn't get it, this is why these things are happening to you. Because my house lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. I feel the weight of the Spirit on my heart when I hear these verses. It weighs on me dearly. I don't believe I need to do that much more preaching for you to feel the weight of God's Spirit on your heart when he says these words. I'm sure you can begin to imagine right now the various ways that you busy yourself with your own house while leaving the house of God in ruins. I say that at the risk of over-spiritualizing these words. This message is to God's people at this time, and God calls them to build the house. It's very specific and measurable. God has called them to obey in this way, and they need to, but instead, they're looking after their own affairs. I think the principle holds true, though. We often do essentially the same thing. I mean, we could think literally for us might be, Um, What is the state of our church buildings? Do we have lavish houses while our church buildings are falling apart? Um, But I think the real applications lie deeper and truer to our hearts than that. We busy ourselves about our own affairs. For those of us who have been Christians for a long time, it is very easy to get up and face every day like, okay, what am I doing today? Instead of asking, okay, Lord, what are we doing today? What have you called me to do today? How can I live for you today? Part of the reason is we 
lose sight of the Lord. We focus on the tangible things about us. We need to eat. We need to work. We need to come home. We need to shower. End of the day, we need to sleep. And where is our time with God and all of that busyness? We lose sight of him. We focus on our lives. We do our own lives. And the true things that God calls us to do, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, that falls by the wayside. Our Bibles get dusty. Um, our spiritual disciplines fall into disrepair because we busy ourselves about our own lives much in the same way as the Israelites are so concerned at establishing their paneled houses and their safety and their crops while they know what they're called to do and they're not doing it. If you sit down to consider your ways, um, would an honest search of your heart reveal that you seek first the kingdom of God? It's a challenging question for all of us to consider. Do I seek first the kingdom of God in my life? Or perhaps are there other things in my life that I seek first? That's an opportunity for us to cry out to the Lord, see if there be any wicked way in me so that I can cut it out and repent of it. Verses 10 and 11 remind us that we are not to be surprised when we face these unfavorable consequences of our sin. The heavens above you have withheld the dew, the earth has withheld its produce. I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, the grain, the wine, the oil, what the ground brings forth, even on man and beast. I'm reminded that the Lord is the Lord of heaven and earth. He opens and closes the womb. He takes care of the sparrows. He commands and speaks and summons it all. So we should not be surprised when um, our sin brings about consequences, that is, a lack of God's blessing because he is sovereignly in control of it all. Seeking after our own kingdoms is essentially the same thing as striving against his kingdom and removing ourselves from his blessing. There are enough instances in the Bible when God withhold withholds fruitfulness, even withholding the fruitfulness of the womb, I think for us to consider this question, do you feel, and again, we have to do this carefully to avoid prosperity, gospel, bad doctrine, but to ask yourself, do you feel as though God has called a drought on your life, as though there are blessings in your life that are not coming to you carefully said, as though you strive and strive and strive and you feel no success. If you feel like perhaps that is the case, then I don't urge you to pray to God to ask him to give you an airplane. I urge you to consider your ways and see if there be any wicked way in you. Because God does not cause bad things to happen to us so that we would be coerced into loving him. God highlights the symptom of our frustrated fruitlessness as a gentle and loving way to expose the sickness and sinfulness of our hearts. He calls us to turn from the vanity of our idols, of idolizing our lives, to return to him in humble worship and repentance. And he reminds us that we can look to him for the sake of his name, his glory, and his pleasure. And in those things, we can be satisfied. One last thought on this section before we move on. We are not called to turn from building our physical houses and to build God's physical house in the way that the Israelites are. We don't have a literal building project that we need to go and get supplies for in order to obey. But we are called to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And one of the chief ways that we are called to build God's kingdom and not our own kingdom is in 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm just going to read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, 
are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to you to do, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, we proclaim this message. And in doing so, God works through us to build his house, the house that we are being built up to be, to be the bride of Christ. We don't have to go up to the hills and get wood to build God's house anymore. But we do have to go up. The wood for God's house is all over this city. It remains for us to go up and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you, even to the end of the age. These are Jesus' words to us. He calls us to build his house. We must hear his words and do them. Verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month in the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. In verse 12, we see that the people obeyed God. They heard God's words And they weren't hearers only, but they did them. They obeyed the Lord. Not only did they obey, but they feared him. They didn't save it for later. They didn't look for a better time moment to obey. They responded in a right now moment to obey. Their obedience started with their repentance. So they heard, they considered, they feared, and they obeyed. Verse 13, in response to their obedience, God gives them an additional word of the Lord, an additional message of hope and encouragement. I am with you, he says, no matter how difficult it is, no matter what challenges you face. It is not an easy task to go and make disciples of all the nations, but behold, I am with you always, God says. We carry the hope and the strength of this message, even the strength of Jesus himself with us as we go to proclaim today. Verse 14, the Lord stirred up their hearts with courage and action in their obedience. Their obedience at first was a matter of the heart where they repented and they set about the work of planning. Um, I think there's a couple weeks, the first day of the month, to the 24th day of the month, so roughly three to four weeks pass by as they hear this message and take action in planning and gathering materials to the last day when they actually start the construction. But they take action. They, they plan, they act, they do the word of God. And that is simply the message that we are called to do. We are called to do the words of the Lord, not just to speak them or to know them, 
the Lord stirred up their hearts to do, to build his house. And may the same things be said about us. May the same things be said that we hear God's word and that we obey in the right now moment. May the same things be said about us that God is with us and we carry the hope of that message. And may God stir our hearts to courage and action in building his house. Even on the 25th day of the ninth month of the 2022nd year of our Lord, the King. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Again, we thank you that your word is simple. We are called to hear and to do it. Father, we pray that you would give us the strength to consider our ways. Lord, we thank you for the way that you so graciously and gently come to us as a father and call us to consider our lives, to consider whether we are living for you or not, to consider whether perhaps the consequences of sin that we experience are in fact your hand as you call us to turn, to believe in you, to repent, and to find satisfaction for the sake of your name, including the blessings that you give. We pray that you would give us courage to build your house here in Port Townsend, that we would be willing to go up to leave the obsession over our own lives, building our own houses and kingdoms, to really build your house and your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us, that you help us to overcome the difficulties, that you will never leave or forsake us. So we pray these things for us, for this church, for our city, for the sake of your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.